Um, just make sure we can, you guys online can hear us. I'll kind of watch the chat. Um, welcome back to Wait at the Sleeping Lady. It's so good to be back. It's been three years since I think most of us um, have been here. And it just feels good to be back in this space and this beautiful venue and um, just so much different than that virtual experience we've had the last couple of years. Um, my name is Corey Turntine. I work for the Spokane Conservation District. I'm operations manager, um, been with the district for about eight years. And um, I'm your track lead for the next couple of days. Um, it's my first first time uh, leading the, the admin finance track. So I'm open to any and all feedback, especially if you guys have ideas and recommendations for next year. I'm sure I'll be in the same position. Um, so any suggestions are always welcome because you know this is for you guys. So um, just a couple, I guess, kind of housekeeping things for the next couple of days. We have bathrooms just right across the way from us, refreshments on that end of the building. Um, we are recording all sessions the next couple of days. So if you have some competing needs or um, those of you that are online um, have other meetings to attend, there will be uh, presentations available after the fact. Um, let's see, we have a presentation with Jean later this afternoon at 2.30. It's in a, like an 80 minute slot, but the presentation will be probably about an hour at most. And so if you have another session that maybe you wanted to attend that same, that same, same time slot, maybe you could catch both of them or um, we could keep it open if you guys have questions or other topics you want to discuss while well, we're all here together with our peers and kind of have a sounding board to go off of. Um, let's see, I feel like I had some other things. Um, for those of you who are uh, joining us remotely, I want this to be as interactive as possible. And so um, I'll be kind of watching the chat throughout the day and answering questions, allowing people to speak. Those of you who are in the back, they can hear you, but you have to speak up a little bit. So you don't have to come up to speak, just kind of uh, make sure that those who are online can, um, can hear you when you have a question or, or a comment. So uh, first presentation for the morning is from the commission ladies from the finance group. Um, I'll let them kind of introduce themselves, but we have Sarah Grove, Ashley Woods, and Carla Heinen. Good morning. Good morning. So um, we don't have, this is kind of a nice ease back into in-person with it being just a fiscal year close and not a biennium close. Our presentation is a little bit lighter. Not as much that has to close out. So um, like Tori said, I'm Sarah Grote. I'm the fiscal and budget manager. Um, and I'm actually I'm the fiscal analyst. And I'm Carla Heinitz, the contracts manager. So I do all the agency, interagency, and DSC contracts, and all of the master contracts. Yeah. So um, we also have two other staff who aren't here. We've got Courtney Woods, who is our grants manager and has a good portion of the grants that sit on her desk. Ashley, I think, has got about five. And then we also have Kate, who is new to our team. And she's got three grants currently on her table. Um, you have probably seen, or folks in your districts have seen, that the commission got a couple new grant programs. And those, um, the programmatic guidelines are out right now for districts to submit comments on. So if you have not, please go ahead and take a look and get your comments in. These are new grant programs to us, and it's also a new funding source to us. So there will definitely be some things that we think we have figured out, and then we start going through and we realize, oh, we have to do this, or we can't do that. So um, give us a little bit of grace with that as, as this is new, and it's it's a pretty significant amount of money. Our budget actually pretty much doubled overnight um, with a lot of those. Yeah, it's great. It's really great, but it's also a little scary um, trying to make sure that we're getting the right guidance out and you know implementing the right types of programs and making sure, um, I don't know if, if anybody in here was in the track yesterday afternoon about partnering 
we don't want to put together a grant program that is really hard for you guys to implement. So um, that's why we try to get all of the, the public comments um, out for you guys, all the programmatic guidelines, so you guys can, can make comments on those. But um, it's just kind of a quick little spiel. Um, so do you, do you my, yeah, okay. So we'll go through kind of a, like I said, a little bit lighter version. Typically, if it's a biennium close, everything closes out. We need new of everything at the beginning of a biennium. So we try to make it a little easier and just put together a listing of the grants that actually do close out. So just so that everybody here knows all of the grants that close out our grants that run on our operating budget. And there's a listing of them up there. And Corey, I believe that the presentation is available online after today, but these should also be in the newsletters and any communication that you're getting from the commission. Uh, so for folks that maybe don't know, at the end of a fiscal year, we have to have that line in the sand. Everything has to be done by June 30. We have to have, you know, if you've ordered new computers or any supplies, all of that has to be in your hand by June 30 in order for us to be able to utilize those fiscal year end funds. Um, and I know it's not super helpful right now, but we've got some links. So when these are published at the end, you should just be able to click the links and it'll bring you up to return funds forms. If folks have money that you're finding, oh, we're not going to spend. If you can let your regional manager know if you're unable to get a return funds form filled out or send the finance team an email and we'll help you through filling out a return funds form. That's helpful for us for a couple of reasons. One, it makes us know, it lets us know that you're really not going to spend it. We're not anticipating a big voucher for those. And if another district has an emergent need and this funding might be able to go towards it, sometimes we're able to kind of do some swaps with folks. So um, there's that. And then, go ahead and thank you, Ashley. So the start of fiscal year 23 starts July 1. You all know that. You'll also probably still be very busy working on your June vouchers. Because of the timelines that we've been given by OFM, we need everything from you guys by July 11. It's actually a day later this year um, because it falls on a weekend. Uh, so OFM is giving us one extra day for us to be able to get in and turn around. So we wanted to give it to you guys because we know, we know it's a big push to turn around and try to get everything done. Um, believe me, we get it. If something comes up and the 11th just isn't going to happen, let us know right away so that we can kind of prioritize and get the other grants done. It's not something that it's not like we could give you till the 15th. We could give you like maybe till the 12th. So, um, if, if if that's going to be an issue, because we've had folks where somebody's gotten sick or the district manager isn't able to sign the vouchers, let us know and we can work through that with you guys. Um, sometimes what we've done is gotten the vouchers already and reviewed and just not processed them until somebody could come back and sign up. So let us know and we can help you guys kind of work through anything that might pop up. So again, up there is a listing of We've got three grant programs right now that require a year-end report. Or what, what else do we have? I'm not making a lot of fire recovery, but there's a, oh. a, a fire recovery TA. Okay. Okay. So that's another one. So we'll need to make a note and add that. Um, and on here, it should be the link to each of those reports. But again, this will be coming out in the Financial Times newsletter. So you guys should be able to get those. If you have any questions, just let us know and we can share them with you as well. Um, and just a reminder, we cannot process your voucher until we get these final reports. So even if you get your voucher in on the 11th, just know 
we're going to mark that your voucher's in, but we're not actually going to be able to process it for payment until we get your final report. Yeah. Yes. Is CTA also the implementation? So those two mean the same thing? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And this year, so you all might remember you got a not a huge amount, but I think about $22,000 more this fiscal year in your implementation funding. We put together a report that we think will help us be able to tell OFM, this is what districts use the money for. We understand we got it out quite late to you folks, which is why it's not a required form to be filled out this year. We would love it because we're getting ready to write budget packages. And even if we have a small sampling of this district used the funding to do outreach and got 12 new you know, landowners to participate in programs or uh, Sean, I'm trying to think of what are some of the other questions that we asked, but um, so we understand that we got the form out late, which is why it's not required this year, but it will be required next year. So just as you guys are rolling out your grant program in the next fiscal year, just take a look at those. We're not going to change them substantially. There might be an additional question. Can't imagine that it would be, you know, collecting a ton of new information but it just kind of helps us be able to go back and report to OFM and the legislature how we use this funding and what we were able to do with it. Are there any questions? I have a question. Can I pipe in? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> this is Zora from online, so I don't know what it's like in the room. Um, on the, on the, on the um, reporting forum where they were asking uh, you were asking about the CTA funding. Most of what was on there were things that were very like um, concrete and uh, I don't know, sexy, like like outreach stuff and really big impactful stuff. And we used ours really for like administrative work and things that are so important, but a lot less flashy. Do you want us to report on things like that? Is that helpful still? So Shauna can chime in if I'm if I'm off, but it's important for us to report on it. But it's difficult for us to keep saying to OFM and the legislature, we need more money, we need more money if we're not doing anything new and above and beyond what we were doing before with the money. Um, we get it. It's not always going to be the, the fun and exciting flashy things that we can report on. But it's really hard for us to keep saying, well, the districts used it. I mean, what I've heard a lot is, well, we used it to keep the lights on. Well, were the lights off before you got that new money? Like, did, did it allow you to hire an additional person? Did it allow you to make some kind of change? Even if it's not a, a super flashy change, my thought is we need to report on it, Corey. So we use ours for administrative funds as well um, to pay for a couple of our administrative staff. But we did that instead of project work or something more specific to because we have just like a lot of campus development construction costs this year. And so it's kind of, so I guess when we do our report, that's good to know, we can kind of provide that perspective. Although we paid for administrative staff, it allowed us to do Right, this other stuff with, um, you know, funding that was less discretionary. Yes, yes, more discretionary. absolutely. Right, that that's <clears throat> that's what we want to be able to do is even if it's not super fun or exciting, be able to say, you know, maybe we didn't do all of the options, we didn't do additional outreach, we didn't do these tasks, but we were able to keep our staff employed or offer additional benefits or whatever the case might be, you know, allow you to use your more discretionary funding. I don't want to say to, you know, to expand, but, you know, to put in a demonstration garden or whatever you might be doing, even though it might not be super flashy, it's still important for us to be able to say that because if you guys do something like that, then, you know, the next year you might be able to say, with that additional, you know, 
CTA funds, we were able to bring 10 groups of school kids through this area that we developed to show them this or whatever it, it might be. So yes, or it's still important for us to be able to go back and say, this is what we did with the funding, even if it's not super exciting, if that makes sense. So you said a portion was of our implementation was CTA. Do we only report on the CTA or all of our implementation funds? It's the difference. I, I think I'll right. clarify. <clears throat> and for those online, this is Shonda Joy from Back to Road. Uh, what we're trying to report on is the additional impact that that extra appropriation made, right? So it was like 20,000 something. 22,000 yeah. So we're trying to get a handle on what impact did that additional appropriation have? So I hope that helps a little bit with your question. Yeah. So we had um, a question from the from Valerie from Cascadia. She says, can you talk about how you leverage the funds to run other grants? And she says some grants don't allow for overhead or even staff time. So operational funds allow us to use those sources that would otherwise be out of reach. Yes, absolutely. That is huge. Um, so in our annual report, we've got a little section in there that we talk about the leveraging. And so any additional information that you guys can provide and share with us is helpful because then we're able to report that back out as, you know, your $1 really got $8, whether it be additional state, local or federal grant funding. So great question. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? It, just really quick, it might be helpful. Um, this is Zora, sorry, trying to turn my video on. It might be helpful. I know sometimes I wasn't planning on filling this out um, before, before seeing this presentation. So I'm definitely gonna fill it out now. It might be helpful to other district managers or admin people who are going to be filling it out to have some of these like, alternative scenarios, because um, I know just this conversation peaked in my brain. Okay, yeah, there's definitely, like we hired extra staff and we put you know, time towards implementation that allowed us to do that. So you might get some better, more impactful answers with some FAQs. Thank you. Thanks, Zora. I see both Carla and Shauna making a note. So we'll make sure that we, um, we get a little bit more information included in that. Okay. So, thank you, Ashley. So by July 30th, we will need your new fiscal year 23 grant addendum forms. Um, early next week, you should be getting a notification from me that will list out all of your award notifications. It'll have implementation, irrigation TA, prep TA, engineering, and then um, shellfish and NRI. There won't be a new round of awards unless we get a lot of return funding. Um, and then as the new grant programs get up and running, those will go out as well. But we do need by July 30th, um any addendum forms and then you don't have to but if you wanted to fill out um, and go through the initial payment request process you can do that as well and there is no real time on that we just like to process that before we process your first voucher so that's just an optional form are there any questions on that okay when will awards go out so I'm hoping to get the award notification letters out next week, um, but July 1, once you've gotten that, so hopefully it'll be next week, July 1, you should be fine. To start spending. To start spending, yep. That letter will give you that authorization to be able to start spending. I always try to get it out by the 20th, um, but it just kind of depends on any carryover funds in like prep or something if you use our TAs rolls over? Yeah, so I will be working closely with Brian and John to make sure that they, Brian for prep, if he's awarded funds, they should just roll right over. There shouldn't be, you shouldn't have to do anything else. Um, 
and John for the irrigation efficiencies TA. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Ashley for the irrigation. And then Kate is taking on the CREP program. Uh, she's still in the process of learning that from Courtney. So you might see some stuff from Courtney and you might see some stuff from Kate just kind of as they continue to transition through that. So, and this is an optional form. We only need a new authorized signature form if you have changes. If nothing has changed from last year, you do not need to send in another one. We have found, especially in the last couple of months, we've had a lot of folks that are signing timesheets maybe, or signing for vouchers, and they're not on the authorized signature form. So we have to stop, reach back out to you guys and ask for a new one. So it's just a reminder, but if you don't have any changes, um, no need to, to make any updates. Okay. And the last year policy should be good for the two years, but what about the additional non-prep stuff that may not be addressed in our current policy? So that we would address it um, in the programmatic guidelines at this point. Um, the current cost share rate of you know the fifty thousand that is something that we are looking at. Um, the finance and RM team have it on our list of things to go through. We will not be making a change to it until the start of next biennium. And it will be something that will go out for districts to be able to comment on. Um, probably late fall, early winter is when we'll start, start that work. But yes, Tom, that is going to be something that we know we're gonna have to address. Yeah, is, Frank is asking me these questions on like, uh, they should give us programmatic guidelines like perhaps yeah. so that we're not like, yeah, well, and we do 100%. Can we do 100%? Can we do because if you're doing the criterion work, nobody is going to play any money into it. It's not right. going to be fast. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, and those those um, proposed programmatic guidelines are out right now. So yeah. if, yeah. if you haven't taken a look, please do and get your comments in. But the that's one of those new programs with a new fund source with a new type of activity that we haven't typically done. And so, like I said, we'll, we'll start it, we'll work on it, and then we'll realize, oh, we need to make an adjustment here. So just right. let us know, hey, we're running into this problem, you know, talk to your RM, talk to, you know, myself, Shauna, Ron, um, and we can try to work through some of those things if you're like, yeah, this isn't gonna happen. Let it, you know, it, it's important yeah, for us to. It's like, it's just, you know, do we want to try to hire a crew or do we just contact the density? And then if we do that, do we have to send it out to bid? All these different things that you don't really have to think about with prep because that's right. different. And yeah. So I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. This, I don't think, I would, my feeling would be, I would advise you to follow normal guidelines and forget the CREP piece, how you kind of sometimes don't have to follow as many rules because this is state funding and the type of fund it is, it should follow any of the regular rules that you would for shellfish, NRI, any of our other grant programs, if that's helpful. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so up in front of you is the grant contract procedure manual. Just a couple um, things that some folks have been getting tripped up on is we do require monthly vouchering, no matter how small the voucher might be. Um, Any time that we stray from what we put in our grant and contract procedure manual, we have to request uh, an exception to that policy. So if you are like, well, I just wanna build quarterly, we actually have to go through a big internal process to be able to say, yes, you can build quarterly because it's going outside of what we say is our, is our policy. And then we can get in trouble with the auditor's office, which is the one thing in our last audit that they told us we needed to make sure we had started making changes, but we just need to make sure that we're documenting it. It's just like any time that, you know, if you guys have something that pops up on a voucher and it's from two months ago 
and the invoice came in later, the invoice was stuck on somebody's desk and they're out. We can most of the time work through it with you, but it just requires us to acknowledge that it didn't follow our normal policy and procedure and this is how we're addressing it. So um, the other big thing that we've noticed a lot lately is folks vouchering for charges that are two, three, four months old on like if, if you're getting ready to prepare your May vouchers right now, it really should only include May charges. You can't be going back to January. Now, if you forget some mileage or an invoice pops up, we can address those. But we've been having a lot more consistently of folks putting in charges from months ago. Sometimes credit card charges take a long time to go through the collection space. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to like bill you until I actually get the bill from the staff when it got yes. paid. And it's like two months old. Like, yes. Oh. Yeah. So on those types of things, just make a note, place order on this day, charge actually hit on this day, and then we'd be able to see when the charge actually hit. So we'd still be following the grant and procedure manual, but just that note kind of clarifies for us internally as we're processing that voucher. But yes, I know it's a painful process. Yeah. It's Sunday like the news or something. Don, I have a hard time hearing you. Oh, okay. Just if you know if you have any other questions, like can you speak up a little bit? I'm gonna say just so I understand because on occasion there is that invoice for some reason they did send us an invoice and we didn't get it in and it's a month late, they backdated it and everything. If something weird like that happens, it would you're asking for that we at least put a note there. Yes. And we'll kind of address it. Yep. Do the best that we can, but if something like that does happen, if you put a note on it, then yeah, exactly. If you put a note like, oh my you gosh, know what's going on, that like, hey, just right. looking for slapping here. <laughs> well, yeah, and I don't think we'd ever, we would never yeah, assume I know. that a bookkeeper is slapping. Slapping. It's a bookkeeper, that's right. Yeah. Like, ah. so, you know, but, you I, know. I think the biggest thing that we have found um, is put a little bit of information, explain yeah, it for us, and then notes of what's going on. Right. Then it's a lot easier. Like, we've had a couple folks who, you know, might have built something to their engineering grant. Right. And then they run out of funding on their engineering so grant. Have so then you have to rebuild. Mm -hmm. Just remember, we can help you work through that, but reach out to finance staff first so we can walk you through how we can do it. And we can go back a month and make an adjustment. You can't go back to July charges and back them all out. We've had some folks do that in their June voucher, try to go back for the whole year. And it's really difficult, um, but it's also, we have to go in and change every single one of those past vouchers and basically reprocess everything. So it's not an easy process for us. So if something like that happens, reach out to us and we can problem solve with you on, well, we can't really do this, but we can do this and here's how we can, Right. get you guys to where you're wanting to go but it's not something that we want you doing every month um but you know if if something happens reach out ask courtney this happened how do we fix this or how can how can we move forward um yeah good question sorry we had a vendor recently that didn't fill us for for Felissa in january they realized that they decided to bill us as of this month. Is it still okay to include that in the June factors? Or do we need to reach out and say, hey, this was actually January where we just didn't get a bill until then? That's what we would prefer is for okay. you to let us know this is what happened, this is when we got it, or we've had districts that have said, like, I have reached out to this vendor 10 times and they will not send me an invoice. We can make a note of that on there and then we can allow that to be paid. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, do you want us to go to ask you for like prior approval or just include it in the notes in our voucher and then we can deal with it kind of in the approval process? So it depends if it's like a one time thing and not a huge dollar amount. Mm -hmm. 
we can address it, make a note, give us a heads up like this is happening and we're gonna put it in there. If you're trying to go back and do something from months ago or it's a $10,000 bill or something, reach out, let us know. And again, we can help you kind of problem solve. Okay, here's how, here's how we need to do this. Here's the documentation that we need. Okay. Type of thing. But if it's, oh, we were auditing our mileage log and we found 25 miles that we didn't bill on last month's voucher, make a note of it and include it mm -hmm. and, and we can go from there. But if it's, yeah, a big if one. it's a big <laughs> one, you know, reach out to us first and we can kind of help problem solve it or at least document that you reached out to us. This is what we advised you to do and mm -hmm. that's why it's on there. Yeah, communication as far as the auditors are concerned and seeing that documented communication yes. is like the biggest thing. Right, yeah. And just so everybody here knows, anytime we do an exception, we have an internal process that we go through where the exception request comes in, the regional managers and the finance team talk through it, we give approval. If it's something that is, you know, significantly above what we're comfortable with, then we all talk about it and it goes to our executive director, Chris, and Chris reviews it, we talk through it, and then we document that that exception has been allowed. So, but that was one thing that the auditor's office said, you're doing a really good job here, but we need a little bit more here. Um, so we've definitely formalized our process more in the last couple of years, just to try to show that documentation for the auditors. So, okay. So we've had a couple instances and I feel like it happens more at the end of the fiscal year where the voucher summary doesn't match up with what was sent in. We get it, things are gonna happen. But each time that you guys send those in and we process them, it just takes a little bit longer. Um, and if you do have a voucher that you guys have caught a mistake on and you want to resend it, if you can, in the title of your voucher, say revise and then let whoever the person is. So if it's an irrigation voucher, send Ashley an email and be like, hey, I caught a mistake. I want to pull this voucher back. Otherwise, she's going to process it because we go by date that they come in. So if she processes your voucher and then two weeks later you send in another one, she might already have processed it for payment. Um, so the other thing that we've, uh, we wanna call your attention to is we send the A19 and the budget spreadsheets to you guys after we process your vouchers. Please check those budget spreadsheets. We make mistakes definitely. It gets really hard once we process the next voucher to go back and make changes to those. So if you guys can please really double check those and let us know, it looks like you made payment to me, but you put it all under outcome one and it was supposed to be outcome two or, or whatever it is, because definitely those mistakes happen. So it's, it's a little harder to go back and change once the next payment has been made. Every once in a while, and it's very rare, we won't get those emails. Okay. It's like, um, I got the next month, but I used the last month. Where is those? Did we ask you then? Yeah, absolutely. Ask us. We So our database system, those are automatically generated. And we went through an upgrade maybe about two months ago in our email service. And I have definitely noticed that a few of them, they just get stuck in the outbox and they don't actually send all the way through. So reach out, let us know because everybody's got access to them. We can put them in another email and send it out to you. Okay. Okay, so this is super helpful to us is just if you guys label your voucher submittals with the grant in the title of it. And if you, are sending in multiple vouchers in an email, which we prefer you not do that because our email kind of sometimes gets a little bogged down with it being too big. And I know, Don, I'm gonna put you on the spot, but you've got a couple big grants where she'll have to send four or five individual scans of like 
the first 40 pages of the voucher. And she does a great job of labeling the name of the grant, part one, part two, part three. It's super helpful for us, but it also, if Ashley is working on a grant and somebody calls me and asks me where it's at, if, if I can just do a quick search by the name of the grant, the title of it, and I can say, oh yeah, we did receive it on this day. Let me check in with Ashley and see where she's at in processing it. It's just super helpful for us to be able to stay organized. We are still <coughs> working from home most of the time. We all take turns going into the office. Um, but when we were all in the office every day, somebody would go in and print the entire inbox and then we would process them through. Now everybody kind of is printing their own. So it is possible that we miss something. So if you label them that way, then it's kind of another way for us to double check that we've caught everything. Questions on that? Okay. Um, the next piece is just a reminder on comp rates. So the effective date of the comp rate needs to be the date that that comp rate changed. So if a staff member gets a raise on July 1st, you would put that July 1st as the effective date, even if you submit the comp rate on June 25th. We've had a, a few folks that have gotten confused about that. Um, and if you submit a comp rate and then you realize, oh my gosh, I forgot my LNI rate or, oh my gosh, I forgot their benefits or something, send us a quick email. Otherwise we'll have two or three comp rates with the same effective date and different dollar amounts. And we don't know which one is accurate. So if you can do that, that would be helpful. Um, and then just when you're doing your voucher and make sure that what you have listed or what you have submitted to us as your comp rate is what you're reporting on your summary pages. We've had a few of those where it's like, wait, they're billing us for $25, but the comp rate we have is $22. And then we have to come back and ask you, did we miss the comp rate update form or what happened there? So does anybody have questions on that? Okay. So I will turn it over to Ashley. She's going to talk now that we're all traveling a little more. Um, we thought it would be a good reminder to kind of go over the per diems because I know for us internally, when we started traveling, Ashley and I are both like, wait, how do we do this? What do we do? How does this work? So, yeah. Before we switch over, um, Sarah Jones says, I've noticed that there's a field for comment in the comp rate form, but it doesn't come through on the printout. Do you guys see those comments that we add in and could we mark a revision there? I don't know. Let me check okay. on that and I can look and play around with it and try to put some comments in and okay. see if I see it. Um, yeah, I believe I addition, originally asked for that so that I could put our step in band in there, but again, it does not come through the printout, so it's not really useful. Okay, okay. Yeah, I don't know, so I can play around with it. And Sarah, I can um, follow up with you and everybody here mm -hmm. as we know. So if you need, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, so for per diem, the state has set forth a per diem for each uh, county. And the districts have to follow whatever county that they're in for the per diem rate. Um, for overnight stays, it's, you can travel like throughout the day, you can travel to different counties, uh, but where you lay your head, if it's overnight, is what the per diem rate is set for, for like how much you'll get reimbursed. Um, if you're just traveling for just a day, then it's 11 hour rule, so you have to get travel status for 11 hours. Um, and each district is required to have their own travel policy that establishes meal times. So for us, our breakfast meal times is between six and seven. So like each district has to have, you know, an hour of for breakfast, an hour for lunch, an hour for dinner, and you have to be in travel status for that whole hour in order to get it, you know, for us, as I said, six to seven. So we have to be like travel status for between six and seven that whole hour in order to get the reimbursement for that per diem. 
Um, in order to get reimbursed for your review, you have to fill out an E20, and that form is on our website. But I've also linked it on one of my sites um, to fill out the like E20 with start times. You know what meals you'll get reimbursed in the rate that you also get reimbursed at. Next slide. And that actually needs to go here too. Um, and then this is just the OFM meal policy. Um, with OFM, we have to, we can be more strict, but we can't be more lenient when it comes to their policies. And so I've just attached the policy just saying basically 11 hour rule um, and overnight travel. And this is a map. Um, I also linked it up, uh, the link to OFM up at the top. Um, and as you can see, each county has a different color than that color on the right hand corner coordinates to you know the meals and then the rates. So if you're yellow, your per diem is $59 for the day, and you get $15 for breakfast, $18 for lunch, and then $26 for dinner. Um and then so this is just the 820, and I just highlighted where you fill it out for per diem. Um, this is where you would put your times, and it kind of helps us to look to see, you know, do you actually get the per diem that you think that you get, um, and like the start times and return times. You know, it's the full 11 hours. Um, you get breakfast, you get lunch, you get dinner, um, and then also your lodging costs over there, and then you put the full per diem with the meals and the lodging. At the very end, where it says total per diem, and then I linked the E20 to the from the OFM website. But again, we also have it on our SCC website. And this is just an example, just in case uh, it gets confusing. Sorry, I'm <laughs> uh, when so like Sally starts her trip at 11 a.m. and then she ends her trip at 8 p.m. So she gets, you know. For lunch and dinner. Um, and then she starts her trip at 9 a.m. but ends it at 10 p.m. So she gets lunch and dinner, but not breakfast because so she wasn't in travel status during the breakfast time. So mileage. Um, this kind of we just found out this morning that the, the, we follow the um, Mileage rate we follow at the federal level. And we just found out this morning that the feds are increased their mileage rate per mile. And so we have to wait from OFM first to kind of have to go ahead. But so this current rate will probably be increasing. Um, and the mileage rate includes, like, not only does it include gas, but it includes maintenance, auto insurance, registration, basically anything that you need to pay to make your vehicle run. All considered to be a part of the mileage rate. Um, and if they ever change, like the Fed rate just change and we follow the federal rate, so we'll notify the districts if there's any updates. Um, and then again, we have an A20 for mileage reimbursement. And uh, the A20 for mileage reimbursement is only for if you have your personal vehicle, but if you have like an agency issued vehicle or district uh, issued vehicle, then you have a travel log. That you fill out for reimbursement. And then I highlighted where you would put that on your H20. And so 20 to 20, you would get. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So um, coffee and refreshments can be served during meetings. Uh, you definitely have to show there's a purpose of the meeting and that there's a reason to have the meeting. And each district is required to have a policy for meals and light refreshments. And um, there's quite a, a lot that you need in order to get reimbursement for meals with meetings. Um, you need a receipt, a list of attendees, copy of the agenda, and a pre-approval form. To show that you have already had a, you know approval obviously for meals with meetings um and you have to show that the form was it and that was something that we had with the auditor's office this last audit that 
you have to show that the meal was an integral part of the meat. Because we didn't have, we, we did our form to show, you know, this is necessary for the meat. Um, and is coffee and non alcoholic beverages and in between meal snacks. So basically, like pastries, um, more nothing like super substantial with meals with me. Um, so then, so we um, just went through this with Lincoln. So our May meeting was held in Lincoln County, and they purchased some waters for the bus and some granola bars. And that's technically a life refreshment. So they got pre-approval, they filled out the form, and that pre-approval is at the district level. So the bookkeeper filled out the form and then had the district manager sign the form. So you can have it be your district manager or, you know, the the board director, but um, whoever has that authorization within your agency to be able to sign off on it. And then on, you know, the reason it was an integral part of the meeting was to provide water. They weren't sure, you know, what the temperatures were going to be that day. And it was more convenient for them to buy the water and some granola bars than to build in snack stops along the six hour tour. You know, um, the again, like Ashley said, the auditor, even though we said, you know, it was more convenient for us to provide meals at our commission meetings rather than have 40 to 50 people leave the meeting location, go to lunch, and come back. They said, well, yeah, it makes sense to us, but that you, you didn't write enough in your descriptions about it. So, again, like Corey was saying earlier, super helpful just to document everything, even if you think well, it's obvious, right? They're not like hurting cats. You don't want to let, you know, 40 different folks who, you know, might not be familiar with the area. You don't want to have them go out in all these different directions and try to get everybody back in a half an hour or 45 minutes for lunch. So you just, you know, document it right after reasoning and then attach it to the form and you shouldn't have any issues with the auditors. So, so you can, but um, I would imagine for lunch is like sandwiches or something. But so you can do dinner without lunch, or is that more? So that's a different part of the form. So you can do meals with meetings. Okay. You know, for us, that was just our example. Okay. Um, but like a light refreshment, they very specifically in the rules from OFM call out no pizza and no snacks. I see. They or no sandwiches. They don't consider that to be a snack. That's a meal. Um, so what we tend to tell people is if they're going to go this route, granola bars, the prepackaged trail mix um, at the Lincoln tour, they had some very delicious cookies, um, that kind of stuff. It's, it's not supposed to be like a whole meal. It's just supposed to be a little snack. Actually, there's a comment from the crowd um, from Valerie. Uh, she says it might be good to point out that lodging is the rate before taxes mm -hmm. and that the, that the exceeding max per diem form is mandatory ahead of time. Yes, yes. Um, they're finding only a few accommodations that honor the published government yeah. rates. Yeah, yes, yes. very good point. So if you are going to go over the max per diem, um, there is a form and we can link it if you guys don't have it. <laughs> Our agency's policy is we don't go above that 150%. So if you can't, let's just say a room is $96, but you can't find a hotel anywhere near your meeting site that has that $96 published rate. So you have to pay $105. You can do that because it's less than 150% of the max per diem. You just have to fill out a form and state the reasoning. You know, I called four different hotels and nobody could do it. Um, Lori has been fighting this for our agency, that it, it's getting increasingly hard to find 
hotels that are willing to give you the per diem rate. And I did ask, um, I've had a couple of folks reach out and ask about my rates and a couple of folks reach out and ask me, do you think that OFM would ever change their per diem? I wouldn't hold my breath on that. Um, that again, is set at the federal level and OFM follows all of that. Um, but if you're having a really hard time finding something at the per diem rate or even you know, just a little bit above, fill out the form and document, you know, I called these five hotels and these were the, the range of rates that we got. Um, yeah. More documentation, the better. And it just it goes to back up your your story of I tried all of this and I couldn't find it. Like I did my due diligence and, and there were no options. So so kind of dovetailing with that, the GSA rates which you highlighted. OFM has the incidentals in it for the state. But if you're going out of the state. Do you forego the incidentals, or is there a way for us to ask for that so you get the full per diem rate for the day? So Ashley's done it more recently than I have, but I believe that the five dollar incidentals is just down at the bottom. Right. Okay. So you can just put that in and, and loop it in to the whole total, and that's what we would go back mm -hmm. if it were out of state. So like the per diem map will have like $59. Right. And so like with the per diem, if you're in Idaho and the per diem is $59 and so you just do the same, whatever is on that map, that's how. Oh, you're gonna be putting it to the state, to our state? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like, yeah, yeah. So it's okay. a lot easier to do it that way. Right, because mm -hmm. if you go with their, this is how much per yeah. person, then we have $5. Yeah, and that's yeah. just so confusing. So if you could just go with like whatever's on the state map, that's much okay. easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> so just a reminder that we can always do any kind of training if you've got new financial staff or if you haven't done cost share in a while um, or if you just need a refresher, reach out to any member of the finance team and we can get one-on-one -on -one training scheduled. We do also have a few webinars on our website. If you're like, I remember something about this, but I just can't remember what I need to do. I will even go back and rewatch them and just listen to that one part again. Um, but Courtney can always set up a one-on-one -on -one training. Uh, and just a heads up, it sounds like within the next probably six months to a year, Ecology will be getting rid of our desk phones. And when that happens, folks will be letting you know and we'll send out a new set of contacts. Um, they're in the process of it now. So these phone numbers might change in the next couple of months. But. So then here's just a listing of all of our staff duties. Again, um, some of the grants might change. As you can see, Courtney's got quite a list. Um, and some of the new programs that are coming up will most likely go under Courtney, which means Ashley and Kate are going to absorb some of these other ones. So we'll let you guys know as those changes are happening. Um, but again, just Thank you for your patience um, over the last couple of months as we've been short staffed and kind of reorganizing things internally. Um, um, if an employee works an hour of overtime on a commission grant, how does the district get reimbursed for that higher hourly cost? So they would, on the timesheet, have the number of hours at their regular rate. And then on the timesheet, there should be, it should be identified as overtime and the number of hours. And on your comp rate form, it does have your regular rate and then an overtime rate. So as long as you document it, it shouldn't, there shouldn't be an issue. And I've seen a lot of districts on their summary page say, you know, 42 hours at, and it'll be the regular rate. And then the one hour at 
the higher overtime rate. Um, and that's just super helpful for us, but it should show. All right, ladies. Well, um, thank you so much for your presentation. You guys, I hope you guys know how much you're appreciated. All the emails, timelines, reminders, patience that you give all of us. I'm sure you guys have a lot of repetitive emails that go out and problem solving. And um, I think I can speak from all of us and to say that you guys are so appreciated and we respect you guys. So. And, love having your support at the conservation district level so we only have about four minutes to break before our next session so no you guys are totally fine that was an awesome session well i'm gonna clap <laughs> Can you bill for more than 40 hours for a salary That's from Zora. Right. Okay. Yeah.